Food is an essential element of any Indian festivity, and Chef Yudhika Sujanani is passionate about sharing her love and knowledge of Eastern cuisine. Let's join Yudhika in the kitchen as she shows us how to celebrate the Indian way with seafood, chicken, and something sweet. I love cooking and entertaining and take inspiration from Indian culture and heritage. I mark all celebrations with a feast, sometimes a small, simple one and sometimes a more extravagant one. I'm preparing a celebratory meal today and on the menu we've got deliciously Moorish prawn pakoras, we've got a chicken dish called murg masala in a thick, delicious, silky sauce and for dessert I'm actually quite excited to share the recipe for one of my favourite cakes, a gajar halwa inspired carrot cake. I'm going to start with the prawn pakoras first. About 500 grams of prawn meat here. This goes into the chickpea flour. To that, chopped coriander. It's quite a simple recipe, but these are absolutely delicious. Chopped onion. I always use my fingers. I think it works a lot better than a spoon. Chili. And you can add more if you like. And you can also use a combination of green and red chili for this. I've got fragrant rub. Adding some of that in. Baking powder, a teaspoon. Salt. Garlic, this is fresh garlic that's been pounded. And now some cooked rice. This is basmati rice. Let's move that tray away. And just mash these ingredients together. Water going in and just keep working that around. You don't only have to do this with prawns, you could use chicken or even fish. That's ready. Let's heat up a pan, on a medium heat, I would say. And I've lightly greased this pan with nonstick spray. Sunflower oil now going in. Let's heat that up slightly and drop spoonfuls of batter into the hot oil. This doesn't look like the most glamorous snack, but your guests will have it down in no time. I generally serve these in my kitchen. Most of my guests enjoy being in the kitchen with me while I cook, so these don't even make it onto a serving platter. The wonderful thing about greasing the pan with a nonstick spray is they almost never stick, but always seem to when there's a mother-in-law watching. And flip those over. You could half fry these until they're very pale in color and refry them just as your guests arrive and that ensures they are super crispy and also hot. Let's get the first ones out and they go into a strainer. Let's start with the murg masala. I've already prepped some ingredients for the chicken dish and for that we're going to need some chicken thigh fillets. I've actually seasoned this with some red chili powder and turmeric to start out some sunflower oil going into the pan. Just a generous plug. First, spices going in, a cinnamon stick and bay leaf and a tiny pinch of cumin seeds. To this, some finely chopped onion. Move those around a bit and some salt. Just a teaspoon. Curry leaves now. These are from the garden. It smells delicious and we've only just started. The salt and the onion speeds up the browning. So if you're short on time, it's a lovely little tip for you. I've got some freshly ground ginger and garlic paste that's going into the pan. Remember, always add the ginger and garlic on the side of the pan so it doesn't hit the oil and burn. Give that a stir. Scrape the pan if there's any sticking. And now red chili powder, also on the side of the pan. A quick stir, we're almost ready to add the chicken. We're gonna coat the chicken in the onion and red chili with the ginger and garlic as well. And a little cumin going in, some coriander and some garam masala. Remember we've added the turmeric already. We mix that through. So when the chicken starts to stick, don't add water, add the tomatoes. Work that in. Simmer the tomato until it forms a thick paste. It's bright red in color, it looks quite spicy as well. Make a well in the center of the pan. And we've got this nut paste, either cashew or almond, going into the center of the pan. 
what I'm doing here is just getting that moisture to evaporate from that nut paste and mix that through now into the chicken. If you're going to serve this with roti or paratha, you could have a drier curry. If you're serving it with steamed basmati rice or even a palau, remember to add a little more liquid to give you a better sauce. Just a touch. Water is only used to give you a sauce in chicken, but not to actually cook the meat. Those onions have dissolved. Now you can add the fresh cream. And some kasuri methi. You can just crumble this in. Doesn't that look wonderful? And while that's simmering, I'm going to get the ingredients for the cake. For the carrot cake, we've got some grated carrots here, starting out with the six eggs. Let's get that going. Whip the eggs until they triple in volume. They should be light in colour and really fluffy. The eggs are perfectly whipped. It does look like vanilla milkshake. Now add the brown sugar. It does look like a fair bit of sugar, but this is a large cake. Remember, it is for a celebration. Beat that on a low speed until the sugar dissolves slightly. The egg takes on a light caramel color from the brown sugar that we're using in this recipe. And let's take a look. So what you're looking for is the egg should leave a trail on the surface for about three seconds or longer. This is the messy part, getting the whisk back on. To this, add vanilla essence. I hardly ever measure it, just pour. And then some sunflower oil. Once again, beat that lightly. When you add the oil, it does look like the mixture split. Give it a few seconds and it comes together really nicely. To this, add the dry ingredients. We've got bicarb, salt going in as well with that, some baking powder, cardamom going in, cinnamon, we've got nutmeg and a bit of mace. And to this, let's add the flour. Gradually, working a little at a time. And work this through on a low speed. Add the grated carrot. Careful not to get the bits everywhere. The carrots work through quite nicely. And just scrape that down. It's really thick in texture. And always check the bottom of the bowl to ensure the ingredients are well mixed. I've greased and lined three 20 centimeter or eight inch baking tins. And this is just with some nonstick spray and baking paper. Remember not to use grease proof paper. You must use baking paper for this. Now just divide the batter between the three tins. You can add nuts to this, but remember there are so many people with nut allergies, so it's best to bear that in mind. That's the last of the batter going in. Use the spatula again and just scrape that in. Oh, I can taste the spice. Bake in a preheated oven at 170 degrees Celsius for 25 to 30 minutes. Once the cakes are baked, turn them out into a wire rack and leave them to cool. I've made one already, so it's time to frost them. To finish up the cakes, the first cake going onto a cake board. Stick that down with a bit of buttercream. Flip it over, remove the paper at the bottom, and place that on top. For the sides of the cake, just keep working over. Now remember, the first layer is just to hold all the crumbs in place. I always thought the first layer had to be perfect and there was only one time I needed to frost the cake. It's actually several times and you need to chill the cake in the refrigerator after each layer of frosting goes on. And that's the best way of getting it smooth and perfect. Use a scraper and just straighten up and getting the sides absolutely smooth. 
actually say it's like laying the foundation for the finished product. For the top, just smooth that down. That's the first layer done. And we're gonna repeat this step until it's perfectly smooth and well covered in the buttercream. I'm gonna pop this in the refrigerator for about 20 minutes. I've done four skinny layers of frosting on this cake and I've worked it until it's super smooth, the edges are sharp. The first thing we're going to do with this cake is we've got some white chocolate here that's melted. You don't want it to be too hot, so just work it a bit and drip it down the sides of the cake. You don't need fancy tools or gadgets for this. Keep mixing the chocolate about so it's an even consistency and you almost use the spoon to slightly push it over the sides and all the drips shouldn't be the same length and that's the last little drip going down and over the cake I'm just going to squiggle a bit of that chocolate over. I love using white chocolate with the carrot cake and not milk chocolate. To make this a real celebration cake I'm going to use some of these roses I've dipped the roses in edible gold and you want some on top but you also want some at the bottom here on the side of the cake. I'm using pink and white roses for this. But obviously you can use gold stars if it's for a guy or even just chocolate shards as well. Whenever I serve gajar halwa I always sprinkle some crumbled barfi on top. It makes it feel like such an exotic treat. Just break that over. Colour diamonds, it just adds that festive feel to this cake. And this takes me back to my childhood, Makwa sweets. And these have a light fennel flavour, which also works well with this cake. And that is our Gajar Halwa inspired carrot cake. For the main course, Murg Masala cooked in that luscious creamy sauce. And I'm serving that with a brown onion pilau rice. The showstopper today, the Gajar Halwa inspired carrot cake. It's the way I celebrate the Indian way.